Well, this is not so much a question, but rather a message from Susan Decker. Hi, Hamish and the panel. And in particular, I'd like to welcome Grace Tame. Grace, what wonderful work you're doing. I had tears of joy when I heard you speak. I'm a 73-year-old woman, and I've been dealing with the pain and the stress in my body and in my heart for all those years. I, like you, was a small girl, and it was my stepfather that ruined my life forever. Keep working, keep encouraging young people to speak, and thank you. Mm, absolutely. No doubt you've heard a lot of messages like that over the last few weeks. Did you expect it? Um, yes and no. Yes, because I know that there are so many survivors out there. Um, but no, because I didn't anticipate the volume. <laughs> um, my phone has been going off. Um, and it just goes to show how important it is that we continue working towards normalising speaking out. Because there are so many stories that we haven't heard and it's in those stories that we find the truth. And, and to our you know, earlier discussion about information out there, we need to hear from lived experience survivors because it's in their stories that we find the truth that can help us move forward. And look, my heart goes out to you, Susan, and to everyone out there watching who's a survivor, I'm with you, right? Grace, so I, I, I do want to ask you a lot of questions, but can you just show us your tattoo? Can you hold that up for the camera? <laughs> look, I've got two, I have to admit. I've got, <laughs> I've got one on both of my hands. One of them says, eat my fear. Can you show, can you show that to the camera? Oh, uh, there. The other one says, <laughs> oh, hang on, don't drink my beer. <laughs> 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 Which totally undermines <laughs> me completely, doesn't it? But <laughs> the eat my fear, yeah. just explain it. Well, I guess it's sort of about um, acknowledging, um, you know, fears and, and, and negativity um, that's naturally out there in the world, um, but being prepared to swallow that and, and, and doing things anyway despite that and actually converting that negative energy into positivity that can fuel you throughout your life. Not every Australian watching will know your story. Mm. Um, can you catch everyone up on how you got to this point of becoming the Australian every year? So does this show go for 11 years? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, to summarise, I suppose, um, when I was 15 years old, I was preyed upon by uh, my 58-year-old math maths teacher um, and uh, he groomed me for a period of months and then started to sexually abuse me. He actually um, raped me um, repeatedly uh, at, at school. Um, and that went on for quite a while uh, until the end of 2010. Um, and then early 2011, I reported him to police and uh, he was convicted um, of, well, the charge is now called uh, the persistent abuse of a minor. It used to be called maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17. Um, but anyway, uh, I, uh, it's so, sorry, my story is, is so tangential. It's, it's very, very hard to summarise. There's lots of layers of injustice um, because... In, in Tasmania, though, you mm, were not allowed to that's speak right. for yourself. Yes. Why? Yeah. Well, Section 194K of Tasmania's Evidence Act previously made it illegal for survivors of child sexual abuse to self-identify in the media, even with their consent and even after they were of age, you know, adult. Um, and when I found out about that, because I was... In 2015, fast forward to 2015, uh, my, myself and an incredible journalist by the name of Nina Fennell um, were working on using my case as kind of a, 
a way to shed light on the issues of child grooming and the lasting impacts of child sexual abuse. And right before we were about to share the articles that we'd been working on, we discovered that there was this law that made it illegal to do so for survivors. And I saw that as another example of a structure in our society that further disempowered victims and gave more power to the predators. Mm. Because predators have a tendency to manipulate the narrative. In fact, that's, that sort of manipulation characterises a lot of the psychological manipulation of these crimes. And so... It just, yeah, it didn't seem, it didn't seem right. And uh, Nina and I, well, Nina created the Let Her Speak campaign. And uh, I lent my story as the initial story. And then we were later joined by 16 other brave campaign survivors um, and a team of lawyers, Mark Lawyers and End Rape on Campus and um, some other partner organisations. And we, we just relentlessly campaigned for years. And the law was eventually changed, actually, last year in April. <laughs> I want to bring you in here. Yeah. I want to introduce you to someone who's here tonight. Jane Matz is in the audience. Uh, Jane, I know you are a survivor yourself. You're an advocate in this space as well. What did it mean to you seeing Grace named Australian of the Year and when, particularly that speech she gave uh, on receiving it? The first thing that I recognise with you, Grace, and congratulations, it's amazing, Grace. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. It's how hard it is actually to tell your story and for someone to be able to tell their story and to make such significant change to a system that silences people is an amazing step. And have Australia recognise that, I am just so grateful. And I'm so grateful for where that will take us and I'm so grateful for where that will take advocates like us who can support you. And, we're, and there's so many of us who would love to work with you, Grace, in to be able to moving these issues of silencing children in particular mm -hmm. forward so that we create change in our country. It is so needed. Yeah. What's your question? My question. As a survivor and advocate in the DV space, I work in so, so many systems that silence victims, family court being one of them. Grace, how, many, how, how shocked were you when you first realised that the court system made it impossible to speak out about your abuse and what steps must survivors take to be heard? I do want to bring the rest of the panel in, but Grace. <sighs> um, I mean, it, it goes back to what I said about the importance of, of truth. You know, it, it's, it's so important that we can speak because when victims are silenced. I mean, the abuse itself is characterised by degradation, disempowerment and, um, you know, feeling like you have no voice, you have no say, and that saying, saying no doesn't matter. It falls on deaf ears because abusers don't... They don't care, right? Absolutely. Um, so it is. It's so important. So, it, so it's... But it's more so than anything, it's important that we empower each other. You know, I'm incredibly proud of Australia for embracing this issue. I'm still sort of in a state of disbelief, you know, from going from being a silenced abuse survivor to having this platform that I intend to use to welcome all the other survivors to join me in talking about this like we talk about mental health, right? It's so important.